Becky, thank you so much for accepting our, our invitation today. I'm just going to read the, the brief note you, you sent us and then it will be up to you. Rebecca Sullivan is a lead veterinarian surgeon for, for medicine at the Dunkey Sanctuary in the UK and a part-time student of, of Master of Science in One Health with the University of Edinburgh. Rebecca qualified as a vet in 2005 and spent a month volunteering with a working act with charity SPANA, also from the UK, in a clinic in Morocco before settling down to work in mixed veterinary practice in the UK and the short stint in New Zealand. A further period spent volunteering for an animal charity in Egypt confirmed Rebecca's keen interest in working equids and the relationship between working equid health and welfare and human livelihoods, health and well-being. A lifelong love of the great outdoors has encouraged Rebecca to be environmentally aware and be involved in projects that support biodiversity and sustainable living. The topic of One Health explores the interdependence between human, animal, and environmental health. In the talk this evening, the background of, to One Health and the relevance to working equids will be discussed. Examples from around the globe will demonstrate how working equids communities put One Health into practice on a daily basis, proving that it is more than just a concept. So, Becky, first of all, thank you so much for accepting uh, our invitation. And I think the best way for us to start, uh, I think is important, if you don't mind, that my, my, my challenge for you is for you to first cover what is One Health. Uh, I think that's a, an important concept that we need to clarify here. And maybe we can then see how working equity fits into this whole picture, this One Health picture. You're in mute, Becky. There we go. Yep. Now, I'll, um, yep. good evening. Now, so two disclaimers, three disclaimers from me. Number one is you have to tell me if I'm speaking too fast. Uh, I'm often told I do. So, Joelle, you just have to interrupt. Uh, number two I is think I speak faster than you, so I'm not. I'm not a good advisor for that. <laughs> Number two is I'm still in my donkey sanctuary uniform. Uh, yes, because I've had quite a long day at the office. And number three is two small children have just come home from swimming lessons. They have been very strictly informed not to interrupt, but if they do, I apologize now. Um, yeah, Bar Barbara has had this pleasure before. <laughs> so I will start sharing my screen. And yeah, let me know if this is all working. So, are we on and on presenter view? Not yet on presenter view. Not yet on presenter view. There we go. There we go. Okay, so I'm very glad that, Joelle, thank you first for, for inviting me. And I am delighted to be talking to you this evening. Although, as I said to Joelle last night, I said my slight concern is that um, I'm teaching the people who probably know more about how equids have a role in One Health than anybody. Uh, in, in, of an audience, but let's let's see how we get on. Um, so first of all, I'm going to do a run through on what what One Health actually is. So we'll go through a little bit of background uh, and some history, and just just draw out some relevant bits, and then we'll move on move on to making it all about the equids that we know and love. So what is this thing called One Health? And to answer that question, uh, I like to go backwards a little bit. And this is how I explain it. I've got a lot of friends who are who are medics and quite concerningly, they have never heard of this concept. Um, it's very much a sort of vet led thing. And back in the day, um, vets and so veterinary doctors, medical doctors used to be taught together, which meant that they could share knowledge and ideas. And as we advanced into the 20th century, um, as it says on that slide, knowledge and techniques became much more advanced. And it was almost a requirement that people became ever more specialized. And the brain, the brain can only cope with so much. And those specialisms kind of superseded that knowledge sharing. However, it's estimated, and it, it depends where you read and who you talk to, but it's always the same sort of range. Approximately 60 to 75% of emerging diseases are zoonotic, so they are transferred from animals to people. And what's interesting is some of those diseases that uh, we might not even think of anymore as emerging, some of them are, are re-emerging. So to be an emerging disease, it's either got to be a new disease or an old disease that turns up in a new place or in a, in a new pattern. I've just put a few of them there on the list and every single one of these 
started out in, in animals and some of them are still in animals and some of them are now only in people. So we've got highly pathogenic avian influenza, human immunodeficiency virus, couldn't escape tonight without mentioning COVID-19, rabies, and then I've put several pluses there. There are so many more, West Nile virus, Hendra virus, uh, the list really is quite exhaustive. And where are we at in terms of our world today? I think it's quite a frightening statistic in that the world population, if you look at it in 1800, was, was 1 billion, and it's now 7.7 .7 billion, and apparently it's predicted to be 10 billion in 2050. And of course, as the population is growing, um, land, land is not. Um, the land we have is, is pretty finite. Um, of course, there's always a chance that sort of volc volcanoes from under the sea may erupt and produce small islands, but coastlines are crumbling. We have to house, feed, school uh, and treat that ever-growing population. I am not going to sit on the fence. I'm going to jump in and straight away say I believe climate change is real. Uh, I think the, the loss of biodiversity or, at least, or indeed the rate of loss is, is terrifying. And when I wrote this slide uh, originally, it was about a year ago, slightly more. Um, and at the time, global travel really did sort of dominate. Um, so I've had to add a little addendum there. Pre-COVID, global travel dominated. Um, my brother works for uh, a travel company, and um, I think they say that global travel no longer dominates, and there's, there's sort of good and bad sides to that. But I'm going to focus on that in the next slide. And I think if we, if we take COVID aside for a moment, I think if you look at the last sort of 10, 15, 20 years, never before have pathogens so any disease causing organism being able to travel so far, so fast and come into contact with so many. I think the longest flight any of us will ever do is probably a sort of 24 hour flight to get to the other side of the world. And 24 hours, an infected person can be on the other side of the world and shedding or possibly shedding bacteria. Or not even bacteria, viruses, bacteria, any form of pathogen. It's interesting when you look at the spread of something called West Nile virus, which spread into the United States. Um, and there are a lot of theories about how that might have happened. West Nile virus has got quite a complicated life cycle, which involves flying insects, birds, um, horses, uh, any sort of equids and, and people. And uh, it appeared in New York um, in the late, I think it was in the late 90s, actually. And it, is, it had previously always been thought of as a disease affecting Africa and the Middle East and suddenly it was in America and as we have now sadly all seen over the last sort of 18 months um, viruses are very much uh, spreading and able to spread so I think that's uh, a sort of very stark um, reminder of where we're at but if I move on to the next slide um, I thought it was actually quite a nice graphic there um, and it's it's a kind of that question, and it's almost um, it's almost interesting that this this talk is happening during the week that COP twenty six uh, takes off, and COP twenty six is of course the the event when the governments from around the world are getting together to discuss climate change and what to do about it, and it's we're, we're told that it's a real sort of make or break point, but I'd like to argue the case that you know things are still salvageable. And for me, where the route that I've gone into is, is this thing called One Health. So One Health is represented by the, by the diagram there on the slide. That's something called a Venn diagram, which is just really simply trying to show that human health, animal health and environment are all very much interlinked. And I've put a couple of words on there, which we'll come back to. Um, and there's a lot of things that you hear about One Health and they all, they all seem to be saying very sim same thing. So it's you know, you're looking at coordinated action, collaborative action, multidisciplinary, and it's it, the essential message is it's working together across those three sectors, and that's on a, an individual level, a local level, nationally and, and internationally. So I wanted just to give a little bit of a, a history or a One Health timeline, because I think, I think this is quite interesting, and you can see how things have sort of gone at a glacial play, pay, pace, sorry, and then a very, very fast pace. 
Um, interestingly, it was somewhere around the 11th century, the 11th or 13th century, um, the Zhou dynasty in China, and that's the first record one has found of an integrated public health system. So there are records from that that period, that 11th to 13th century of, of medical doctors and vets collaborating. And then we have to leap forward several thousand years and we get to, and I'll probably pronounce his name incorrectly, so I apologize now, Rudolf Verkau, who was a German physician who's also a pathologist. And he introduced or coined the term zoonosis. And he had a, a student who worked, who worked with him, who was known as Sir William Osler. And he again was a medical physician. And he introduced this concept of, of integrating health to North America. And he was actually at the, the University of Montreal. And he became professor with, bizarrely as a physician, he became a professor within the vet school. And it was a faculty of comparative medicine and surgery. And Osler actually created this term, one medicine. Uh, sadly, he was a little bit before his time um, and that faculty no longer exists. However, we get to the 20th century and uh, this gentleman here, um, apparently known as the father of, of One Health, he is Calvin Schwabe. He was a veterinary epidemiologist, also a parasitologist, and he published the first known textbook where it again sort of actually published these links between veterinary medicine and human health. And then coming further forward again into the 21st century, so we're in 2002-2003, and it's really what's happened over the last 20 years that has really sort of driven things on. So people may remember, I certainly remember I was sort of midway through vet school. Suddenly people started talking about this strange respiratory disease that was in Asia. And there was a sort of worldwide panic about severe acute respiratory syndrome or SARS. And that really sort of put emerging diseases and emerging viral diseases that had the potential to cause mass panic on the sort of global agenda. And around a similar time in 2004, there was a very influential meeting, a group of people called the Wildlife Conservation Society, and they published these, these things called the Manhattan Principles, and that's simply named after where this conference took place. There are 12 of them. I want to read out the first one because the first one I think is fairly pivotal and sort of sets the scene for the rest of them. I've um, got to try and decipher my own handwriting here. But the first point was that the, these Manhattan principles called for recognition of the essential link between human, domestic animal and wildlife health and the threat that disease poses to people, their food supplies and economies, and that biodiversity is essential to maintaining the healthy environments and functioning ecosystems we all require. So that put that put One Health firmly firmly on the agenda. So what the what the SARS emergence had sort of raised awareness of, there was then sort of growing growing recognition. And then this was swiftly followed in two thousand and four to two thousand and five. There was a highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreak. And over the next sort of five to ten years, international agencies, including FAO, the World Health Organization, um, the, the OIE, who are the sort of the animal equivalent, they got together and they really embraced that you needed this interdisciplinary collaboration to tackle these emerging diseases. And it became really important that not only did we need to tackle them, but we also needed to be ready uh, and prepared for any disease outbreak. There's, uh, I've kept this very simple, um, and I've then put another reference in 2018. The reason why I put 2018 there is that's simply where it's a paper which I find really, really interesting, and I've put a reference to it at the end of this. It's a really quite good and easy read, and that's about something called Planetary One Health. So in this sort of intervening period, sort of early 2000s up to pretty much where we are now, one Health sort of started off being very much about zoonotic disease and risks of risks to humans really from animal disease and emerging disease. And whilst it was sort of purported as being looking at links between animal health, human health and environmental health, there was a sort of very much a feeling that the environmental health was being left on the sidelines a bit. And there's been a few sort of similar concepts. Um, so you've got one called eco health. Um, you've got the allied health and then the sort of the planetary health and essentially what they're saying and 
and the reference that I've got there was written in a British medical journal and they've got a, a global health journal. Um, they wrote all about the fact that One Health seemed to be excessively focusing on, on zoonotic diseases. And there was a real argument that we need to incorporate environmental concepts and expertise and also move beyond just having vets and doctors involved, but we needed to have social scientists, behaviorists, because we needed to look at those sort of behaviors on the individual right up through to sort of big corporations on how people were behaving and how that affected diseases and the health of us all. It's a really nice example in that paper, and I'm sorry because it's absolutely nothing to do with equids, but I thought it was a really nice example. Um, and in that example, they talk about how you can have an animal as a sentinel for a much wider uh, an issue. And the, the example they give is that if you get a, a mass stranding of, of whales, which is sadly not uncommon, you might find as part of that um, investigation into why those whales have stranded, it's not uncommon to find plastic in the stomachs of the whales. So then the question is, why is the plastic in the ocean in the first place? What, what behaviours is, uh, are leading to that? What is the individual doing? What are big industries doing? And what the planetary sort of One Health concept is trying to answer is how, how do we change the behaviour of individual consumers right up to how those big corporations? And so, you know, you, you, start, you start from the 11th century where it was, a, you know, where medical doctors and vets collaborated. And then you sort of moved through this period where that didn't happen. And then it started again around the 20th century, sort of 19th, 20th century that, uh, yes, we need to do that. And we've almost come sort of then taking a leap ahead in that we can't, you know, we need the environment to be healthy as well. So when you're asked to come up with a, a definition of One Health, um, this, this is my sort of, aim, you know, my take on it. So I'll just read what I've put on the slide there, which is One Health can be interpreted as an aim to maintain a holistic state of physical, mental and social well-being for human and animals alike. And that's got to be in synchrony with a global environmentally sustainable lifestyle. So whatever we do, we've really got to keep that environmental aspect at the forefront. And I think what is a really nice thing to keep in mind is it's not just about your physical health anymore. It's about the, the mental and, and social health and well-being um, of, of humans and animals. And we'll come back onto that. So what what does one health involve um i think the the sort of blessing and curse of a very nebulous term such as one health is critics will say that it tries to cover everything um and i think there is some merit in that um but it's so i'm just so we'll come back to that so some of the examples i put on the list well it's addressing food security as i said right at the start we've got a burgeoning human population which we need to feed Disease surveillance was one of the very first uh, sort of initiating factors for One Health. HWLI stands for the Human Wildlife Livestock Interface. And across the globe, particularly though in developing countries, you're getting um, wildlife and livestock are not kept segregated and you have humans living in close contact. And again, as we've seen with some of the influenza viruses, there's a real, a real risk there of of viruses effectively jumping species gaps. Disease control has been the major focus of One Health. I've put eradication with lots of question marks in brackets because I think that is probably the, the sort of the end game for many people, but probably it's a very, very long way off end game. AMR stands for antimicrobial resistance and over here in the UK, um, Antimicrobial resistance has been one of the biggest pushes um, from our from our government that, you know, there's really has been a sort of trying to get vets and medics to look at their antimicrobial prescribing practices. So what antibiotics we're, we're dishing out and why and what effects that has. Um, and then the thing which I hope will be very relevant tonight, there's the human animal bond and that takes form in so many different ways and then looking at animal assisted therapy and we'll come back to that as as we've just said on the previous slide we've really sort of gone forward into looking at biodiversity and climate change and then going back a bit um comparative medicine was another thing that was very very um sort of there at the forefront with one health um so things like 
looking at what medications work in different species, what what can what can what can doctors learn from vets, what can vets learn from doctors, um, anatomically, uh, physically or physiologically. There are some some parallels there. For me, the big one is human and animal welfare, and then the one that I want to make sure doesn't get forgotten is that we really do need to look at infrastructure because one of the basic human needs is is missing is a clean water supply and good sanitation and housing around the world. Um, I doubt anybody's going to be able to sort of pick out the bits on on this graphic here. Um, but it is, I have put a link there and you can go on and have a look at this yourself. But this is something that the uh, One Health Initiative developed. It's an infographic with an umbrella. And they put various things under their umbrella and trying to show uh, how it's all there. And they pull out various things that we've mentioned. Um, but what I think is quite noticeable on this slide is that it is very much still focusing on disease, health and disease, and very much the sort of uh, links and there are there are mentions there are mentions of environmental health there is a mention of uh, there is a mention of ecosystem health um, quite an interesting one is environmental hazards which can be um, humans and animals exposed to and um, one that we often forget about but uh, bioterrorism um, until 10 years ago I didn't even know this was a thing um, but yeah bio bioterrorism uh, is a is a growing concern and I've actually got classmates on my on my master's course who work for actually work for the army in this field of bioterrorism and I've got sort of biologist friends and, and microbiologists who work there. Then there's another umbrella, uh, I think umbrellas are clearly uh, quite symbolic. Um, so this is something called One Welfare, so it's a little bit of an offshoot of One one were health in that people wanted to start looking at one welfare now again it depends on who you talk to personally I'm a huge believer in health and welfare are so entwined that you don't really need to separate them however there's um, a sort of separate one welfare initiative um, I'm always wary that if you have too many different concepts doing a similar thing you risk having uh, detracting from the main message but I've included it here because I really like what's on this this umbrella. Um, I'm just going to read a few of them out, and I promise we will get on to to looking at the equid side in a moment. But they've got on the left hand side animal welfare, and then in the middle human well being, and then in environment conservation over on the right hand side. And it's you look at the human well being, and there's some you know they're they're trying to draw parallels between animal and human abuse, and that's certainly something that. I was taught as a vet, um, and we were taught in our sort of final couple of years to really be on the lookout for any strange patterns of injuries on particularly domestic animals and how that could be a real indicator of human abuse, um, a sad and quite difficult truth. Um, on, I used to be, I have, well, I have at one point been a farm, farm vet and there was a big sort of recognition and it's really sort of growing at the moment that um a happy a happy farmer a happy healthy farmer is likely to provide better care for their animals and you get happy healthier animals um and there's also this sort of thought that the better welfare of the human the better welfare they will take of those around them including the environment so there's a lot of links there and again that's something that i'd say to people you know follow those links go and have a look at that and take the time so what does one health need I'm incredibly conscious that it was very much a sort of a vet led thing, which then had the medics in, although, as I said, right at the start, I have a number of friends who are medics who had never heard of this. And actually, my only medic friend who had heard of One Health um, used to be a vet. So he was a vet and then retrained as a doctor. Um, so, yes, you, you need the vets and the medics, but I think that is just one tiny piece of it. I, I think we need, um, we've alluded to social scientists, behaviourists. Um, unfortunately, money is quite crucial, or certainly economy is quite crucial. So we need economists and um, it's really important to get people who are communicating and just simple things like what we're doing tonight, communicating about what this is. Uh, I've put lots of other terms on there, policy makers, researchers engineers but the main one uh, and that's 
where I sort of want to finish this introductory bit on is I think initially what you need is people who care, people who are ready to be curious, people who are ready to think, um, okay, how, what are the links between, what are the links between my health, the health of any pets, animals I work with, um, and how does what I do affect the environment? And I think if you can start by being curious, you're already quite far on that path to, to being into that sort of one health message so that's that's the introduction um joao any any comments on that little bit or anyone want to ask any questions on that bit yeah maybe we can open the, the session here for this first part do you have any question you'd like to to ask becky or uh you can we, we the group is small so you can either open your microphone and just uh Ask her or you can write on the chat. Up to you. Yeah, go for it. Oh, thanks, Joe. I've just seen you put in the chat the two um the two links there. Yep. Becky, I, I do have a, a question, a, a comment. Well, I, I know you you've been quite deep into this subject. How the specialists, how your professors on Edinburgh and explain the fact that world organizations such the ones you mentioned only start seeing the importance of this probably five years ago <laughs> is that it, it really surprises me you know it's they, they should be leading this process of uh, bringing all these things together and clearly it's not happening it's really interesting and i think one of the things that i've had to really take on board was actually chatting to, to one of our colleagues in our advocacy department at the donkey sanctuary is that as soon as you start trying to address something on a global scale, you, you need to put the brakes on in a way. Um, and that's not put the brakes on what's happening, but it's put the brakes on your own uh, sort of anticipation. Um, and that, that was quite a, a message for me. And I thought very, very true in that what I think certainly seems just very obvious in that how everything is interlinked. Yeah, has taken a very long time. Um, and it's quite scary when you look back and you think, crikey, back in the 11th century, people had realised this. And then what happened? And we almost got too specialised to realise. But it's when you look at, there are far more detailed timelines than the one I gave of what's happened over the last 20 years. And I think it was, it was either 2008 or 2010 when the tripartite agreement was signed, which is between the FAO, WHO and the OIE. And actually there was quite a lot going on in America. So America actually have various One Health initiatives. Um, it turns out that the UK has a One Health task force, um, but these, they're just not widely publicized. And I think that, that to me is very obvious when, you've got medics who are sort of purported as being pivotal to that and it's not being taught and certainly One Health was not taught to me so I graduated 2005 and I remember vividly and I looked this up actually last night when I was preparing this talk I remember there was an editorial in our veterinary journal so it's called the vet record and it was 2005 and it was someone who's very influential within the sort of One Health movement um, someone called Paul Gibb and and here's again there's a reference towards the end with him and you look at it and he gave a he gave a lecture at a conference where he was talking about one medicine and one medicine about how we it was all very much looking at really comparative medicine and there was a mention about emerging diseases but it wasn't it was, it was a mention about what might happen and, and it, that has just exploded over the last 20 years hasn't it I mean it's it's not just SARS, it's not just um, avian influenza. Um, those, I mean, I think apart from me, everyone here is is in Central Europe or, or Western Europe and West Nile virus, it, it's, it's spreading across Western Europe. It has spread across Western Europe this summer. Um, and we see that. And- That is that feeling that we are reactive rather than proactive, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, it does, and it's uh, again when you look into it, there are there are all these sort of government task forces, and one of the things I had to do last year was prepare uh, a sort of an investigation for um, our disease called blue tongue, which is a cattle cattle and sheep disease. And when I was delving into this, I I, I just did not know until then quite how many um, sort of disease outbreak groups we have, and so I think every every government must have them. Um, 
And I think we're very lucky within Europe in that we have access to good laboratory services. We have got access to pretty good, well, very good infrastructure on the whole. Um, uh, I just think, I think at the moment, it's still very much in the hands of governments and scientists, and it's not necessarily filtering down to the people on the ground. Um, and that's, you know, it's what I'm very, very conscious of and what we'll hopefully talk about a bit more with the equids is that, uh, and I've seen quite a few letters about this in our journal, the vet record recently of people going on and on about why do, why do people keep banging on about One Health? Um, it, it's an obvious, uh, but what does it actually achieve in practice? Um, so I think that for me is, is a sort of next step is, is really trying to move it on from being just a concept to, yeah, what, what do we actually do? And I think it's quite easy with the equid side. Um, should, should we move forward and see some of those examples? Yeah. yeah, so looking forward at that. I'll close that one. Okay. If someone has any question regarding this first part, please use the chats and we can, yeah. we can address them at the end. So what, what role do equids play in One Health? Um, and that's, that's my sort of pulled together graphic there of, again, people, <laughs> the tree is representing the environment there. And, and uh, I've got my, my beloved donkeys there, but they're representing sort of equids. Now, for the purposes of this talk, I am mainly focusing on donkeys and mules. There is a, there is a horse photo in there. Uh, see, who, see who spots it first. Um, so I am sort of focusing a little bit on that, but um, it is really fairly sort of generic on, on equids. So apologies if I say donkeys, um, I'm, I'm trying to use a term interchangeably. So where do donkeys and mules fit into this concept? And I've put a few pictures, pictures on there uh, just to show to me uh, what are really sort of classic examples. So up in the top left, um, we've got somebody, I'm going to say interacting or engaging with a donkey. Um, and again, we're going to come on to this, but there's a there is that that picture is there to try to depict the human animal bond. The one on the right, we've got uh, a donkey or donkeys, I should say, carrying containers. I know those containers are full of water, so I can tell you that that's, yeah, that's a donkey carrying water. And we can see just in the background, a couple of human beings walking behind. And that, and the picture in the bottom left where the donkeys are carrying bricks, is just trying to illustrate um, the role of, of donkeys carrying carrying cargo. And then the bottom right, it, it looks like a, uh, a muddy field. Um, Joao, I'm hoping you recognize that photo. Um, it's, it's one one that Joao has sent, and that is representing where equids play a role in in agriculture, um, specifically agroforestry. So, I think donkeys and mules fit into the One Health concept. They are an excellent demonstration of practically applying a concept. So, that in a bit more. So, I want to look first at equids and human health. So. In terms of equity in human health, I've sort of split this into health and well-being and livelihood. And you'll have to bear with me over the next 10 minutes because there's going to be quite a lot of crossover between statements. And hopefully this will all slowly tie together. So under health, I've put transportation. We've got physical health. Uh, equids, I believe, have a role to play in, in human mental health. And again, in, in human well-being and livelihood, transportation comes in. So I'm going to look at some of these in a little bit more detail now. So I'm going to start with transportation. And that image in the middle, uh, that is one that I took when I was in Egypt. So that was back in 2010 or 11. And I think that picture, oh, there's a lot of stories around that picture. Um, I look now, um, I look now at that animal and I think I looked even then at that animal and, and you look at the contrast between the two boys who are sat in the back looking very relaxed and, and smiling and then you look at the, the animal there which looks anything but, but happy. But that's there to demonstrate that we transport or they transport so many things so they can be, yeah, they can transport goods and those goods might be, they might be bricks, they might be bags. 
Um, uh, I say bugs because um, just over on the right hand side, I've put tourists there. Um, <laughs> rightly or wrongly, we often see or we often hear of Equids transporting tourists. Uh, and if they're not transporting tourists, they, they might be transporting tourist bags. There are pros and cons of that. Uh, and again, we've always got to think about um, the livelihood of the, the humans who depend on, on the, uh, the cargo carrying, as well as thinking of the welfare of the animal that's doing the carrying. Um, water, as we showed in that, in that previous slide, and water uh, has been something that we've sort of heard a bit more about recently and I, I really like using the, the illustration of, or the thought of water. I read, I read a paper, I think it was uh, a couple of years ago now, where the paper discussed how it, it's very common that the burden of water carrying falls to women and children and there was a study done that looked at how children um, and young young women who were expected to carry heavy containers of water had significant and chronic damage to their, to their vertebral columns and their musculoskeletal system in general. So by using, and again, uh, it's difficult with that word using, but by by equids carrying water, uh, they are very much contributing to, to human health and well-being in that way, both by getting that fresh water supply to where it's needed, but also by relieving the burden. Food, uh, I, I've got many more pictures of Egypt of a cart piled very, very high with different food items. Schooling, um, schooling is one that uh, I know uh, myself and, and colleagues have talked a lot about this, how uh, particularly in the areas where the infrastructure is very poor and um, children have got to walk a long distance to get to school. If they are able to get to school on uh, on a donkey or a mule or even, even a horse, but it's usually a donkey or a mule, that's hugely beneficial to that human well-being and livelihood and ultimately to their health um, because there is, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm the daughter of two teachers, but I, I do, aside from that, strongly believe that if education is a sort of cornerstone to looking after your whole health and well-being. Medical care is a really interesting one, um, and it's one that I've got quite a lot of interest in just through, through links with uh, another colleague who has done some work with uh, particularly um, pregnant ladies, actually pregnant ladies in remote mountain communities. And uh, they've looked at how in these remote communities, again, the infrastructure is very poor and trying to get both medical care in the form of medical supplies and in terms of actual medical personnel. So doctors, nurses, midwives to remote, um, remote sort of areas. Uh, and, in, and indeed, in the, the specific example I've got was, was the pregnant ladies trying to get midwives to pregnant ladies was incredibly difficult or indeed trying to get uh people to a clinic and that again is where uh it's a hugely um beneficial role that equids can play and disaster relief and the reason why i put that there is um uh, unfortunately when sort of natural disasters strike any infrastructure that might be there is is quite often um rendered uh unusable if that's the right word and again it can be very difficult to get supplies in by vehicle so it's quite often where a vehicle cannot go, an equid can. So then on to health and well-being. Um, it's, yeah, it's all, there's a lot of links from that previous slide, but then, and so you'll see there's a lot of words on this slide. Oh, I'm sorry, because actually the text is probably still a bit small on that one. But there's a lot of links or a lot of rep repetition of words. So the picture I've put in the middle this time uh, is taken at one of our donkey assisted therapy centers. And what, this is the animal assisted therapy that I mentioned previously. And animal assisted therapy, again, probably in the last 20 years, 20, 30 years has taken off in a way and put it in a nutshell, um, and apologies if this is um, saying things that uh, people already know, but there's a sort of this evidence that human beings might find it difficult to engage with a therapeutic process uh, to any sort of form of sort of psychological therapy. 
without any form of destruction and the, there's been a lot where people have looked at bringing animals into that relationship can really help and there's loads of different options of that and one of the well again one of my professors on the course uh, his daughter's school primary school they have reading dogs now this is not dogs who can read books or or actually help with the words but they found that the primary school children were much calmer and much more attentive to their reading when they had a dog in the classroom um, and what's really lovely about this story is the school are very much embrace the welfare of the dog and so the dog actually has a dog flap in the in the wall of the classroom and when the dog wants to escape from the children it can and I think that's a really nice example of trying to sort of maintain that mutually beneficial relationship um, we probably all know about guide dogs um, there are then coming back onto the equids there are various um, riding certainly riding therapy with with horses and then what's happening in the picture there is they um, the lady is doing life skills training. Um, and this is just one example of many programs that we run, but they're in that picture um, trying to just build up confidence with leading, leading an animal and trying to generally promote better self-esteem, better confidence. Um, I've put companionship up there. Um, I think owning any animal um, is can be a huge uh, a huge boost to mental health and, and also to physical health um, certainly with the equids we try and try to encourage owners as much as possible to get out and about and walk them if that is fit for both of them to do uh, I do always smile um, I think Joelle will laugh at the moment because I have uh, a beloved cat who um, it always makes me smile when I say to everyone with my vet hat on that pets are very good for your blood pressure and pets are very good for keeping you calm and my cat has today sent three emails to our reception team uh fortunately none of them were too gobbledygook and I definitely don't feel that my blood pressure goes down with my cat I think it goes up but that's another story um so the, the ones there we've got medical care education disaster relief sharing the load relates really to to that carrying again so really linking back to transport because it's not just water that gets carried uh, it, it's goods as well and again we we see uh we see it in the brick kilns um and where what the equids are carrying the people are not comparative medicine i think we sort of alluded to earlier um and food i've put food there and that kind of links in to um sort of food supply chains where you've got equids involved in I know in South America there's quite a few links with equids being involved in supply chains of uh, both both alcoholic drinks uh, which are not necessarily great for your health and well-being um, but they are they're there and they, they're certainly beneficial for livelihood but also just food in general. So Moving on to equids and animal health, I, I suddenly thought that it didn't seem right to be looking at how equids contribute to human health and how equids contribute to environmental health without looking more in general at how equids contribute to general animal health. So I'll put that phrase up again there, that comparative medicine. Um, and sorry, because what I didn't mention on the previous slide, uh, I've got quite a specific example of comparative medicine. Um, and there are several others, but this is just one that's quite, quite interesting. Um, there is a disorder of the lungs in humans called pulmonary fibrosis. And I was involved in um, uh, just a br very brief sort of project. We had a, a student from a Scottish university who scanning our donkey lungs and looking for patterns of uh, the patterns of this lung fibrosis um, and actually they found that there were some similarities between what what was being seen in donkey lungs and what is being seen in the human lungs and it's just one example of how we can learn from different species but just coming back now onto equids and and general animal health uh, I think it's really important across species to look how different different drugs behave, how different disease processes affect them. And it's uh, it's really important with the whole antimicrobial resistance. Um, 
it's not just focusing on any one species. And the reason why I mentioned antimicrobial resistance there is it's been really, really important to, to look at not just what you're stopping or what you're advising for one sort of species, but across them all. Um, simple things uh, such as spreading the welfare message. Um, I'm very lucky. I work for a large organisation which has got a welfare focus and I've been involved with developing welfare tools. And one of the things I've noticed through this is when I speak to um, other colleagues who work in or work with different animal species they don't necessarily seem to have quite the same knowledge of of welfare tools and that's that's not necessarily true of my sort of farm farm vet compatriots but but definitely on the small animal side so i think there's just simple things there by looking at what's worked in in one species might then be relevant to another's and then biodiversity and wildlife health and you might be thinking how on earth do equids contribute to that and I'll come back to that in a little bit. So just, yeah, there's the animal health slide there. Uh, just really, that's, I probably covered most of that on the previous slide, um, but just two other things that I wanted to bring. Um, so disaster relief, um, again, equids are fairly pivotal in, in disaster situations of being able to get um, various supplies again food medicines equipment um, and there will be many many animals that are affected in disaster situations not not just the human animal so i think that's another another thing that equids can do for their fellow animals there so we've then got the equids and environmental health so I'm going to just start with that conservation of biodiversity. Um, actually, no, I'm not. Sorry, <laughs> I'll change that. We'll come back to that. Um, the other things that we've that we've got there: sustainable power source, uh, and I'll I will come back to this on the next slide. Other things which we know, and I, I know that the audience I'm talking to tonight will be very very well versed in this. Is is this is the effects on soil impaction? And I think equids have also got a role to play in protecting animal health through uh, their contribution to areas where infrastructure is poor. So apologies, I've completely mumbled all of that up, but going back to, to environmental health. So I've been very lucky recently. I have been talking a lot to our conservation team and they have introduced me to, to many many different ways in which um, uh, donkeys and the uh, donkeys at the donkey sanctuary where I work, uh, how they contribute to environmental health. And one of the really simple ones is, is seed dispersal. Um, and this is actually well known throughout, um, throughout the world, it turns out, with equids. So with certain seeds, as with many other species, as, as equids are grazing um, and passes through their system, and then as they move, um, in the wild, these are free ranging animals that travel huge distances. And as they pass feces, they also may pass out the seeds. And it's particularly relevant to, to equids who browse because in browsing, they're selecting seeds from a very, you know, different numbers of plants. Uh, fire breaks is one, I don't know whether Barbara is still on the call, but uh, Barbara introduced me to the concept of equids um, being used, I don't mean actually as, fire breaks um, but they are used in, in certain parts of Italy and it's not not just Italy then various countries again around the globe um, to to browse and feed on vegetation and effectively to create that break in the event of a of a wildfire through consuming that sort of deadening or dry, drying off vegetation um, reduced tree damage so uh, this is something that Joao actually introduced me to. So there is uh, well, there's a couple of studies out there which show that when you're working with agroforestry, um, an equid um, pulling, pulling logs is likely to do far more collateral damage to the trees around them than a tractor, just by very virtue of being smaller and narrower um, with the tractors. And then something that I found really interesting is this avoidance of, of soil degradation. Um, and I know, again, there are a couple of studies out there, and I know there's a couple of authors of those studies out there tonight. Um, 
but I think it's really interesting for anybody who wasn't aware of that in that there's been uh, people have looked at how the sort of impact or the, the compaction of soil from uh, equid feet is so much less and again it seems fairly obvious from from a, a tractor I think what I find really heartwarming and I think it was last year I came to one of the first FECTU, FECTU talks which was all about draft animal power and I think someone there made a, a really amazing point which was that I think probably even until 10 years ago and, I, and we'll discuss that in a little bit um, it was a real kind of thing that actually draft animal power represented an almost sort of a, a backwards uh, or a developing way. And I think as we've got uh, a far more eco-conscious, far more aware over, over the last sort of 10 years, there's a real sort of um, growing interest in what the alternatives are to mechanised power. And I really, I, I do believe and hope that draft animal power is, is going to, it's got its place and actually it's not to be seen as the poor man's or the you know, poor person's alternative and it's there and hopefully that's something we can chat about in a minute. Um, I love this concept of, of sustainable biomass transformation, um, this concept that uh, an equid will consume, consume vegetation will then uh, produce an energy output through digesting that vegetation and will then um, pass feces and return much of that um, much of that energy or sorry much of that biomass back to the ground and fertilize the ground so it's this wonderful cycle um, so i think i think equids have got an enormous role to play in environmental health um, and, and very much as, as we said in human health so What's, what's the conclusion to all of that? Well, the sort of real focus on this evening was trying to get very clear on what One Health is, uh, what One Health is trying to be, and then just try and try to link it to, to equids. Now, I this is a quote, again, probably everyone here is familiar with, um, but I think it's just quite a nice way to sort of end that working equids support nearly, you know, I mean, 600 million people is the one that's often quoted. 600 million people is a is a significant number of people um and if those working equids support those people then i think there's a huge onus um on needing to support the equids um, and i think it speaks for itself that if the equids are supporting the people the people need to support the equids i think we've also now seen that one health itself is accepted on an international scale but what we're now seeing is that there is this growing momentum uh, and I think it's a real sort of crunch point with the One Health in that yeah we know it's a concept that's out there we know it's a concept that makes sense but it's time now to move on from just it being a concept and actually put those practical examples there and the reason why I've put a graphic of some dots there is it's time to start joining all the dots and so my sort of final statement there is people who apply so I think it's really applying all of these thoughts into your everyday life, your working life, and for those of us who, you know, that working life involves, uh, or even your personal life involves being with equids, I think there's a brilliant, a brilliant sort of, um, yeah, you're on a great arena there. So the final slide there is just a couple of references um, that are there, and that, that can be sent round. I don't know Joao, whether you can copy it and paste it, but what I'd really like to do now is yeah, hear from everyone else and hear any any examples of yeah, one health in action with with equids. Thanks, Becky. Unfortunately, I can't copy that final slide. The the other the other links are pretty much texting them. That's okay. I can send them. But thank you so much. Thank you so much for for the first introduction and thank you so much for for linking beautifully all those concepts into the the world of working equids and i really think working equids are are a great example of how we can achieve most of these concepts in terms of one health one welfare uh but but i, I will i will i will leave now the the, the room for for questions uh i'm just going to change the the, the view here so i can see the, the gallery 
And please feel free to, to ask and to join us in this conversation. Just to discuss, um, because I think, yeah, that the, the team that you've got, or people here tonight, I think are very, very, um, very confident in how working equids play a role. Yeah, well, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm, I'm Cesc uh, from, well, fact to board as well from, from Catalonia. Uh, it's interesting because it's the first time, honestly, that I heard about the concept about One Health. You know, I never, never heard about that before, but I think it's very, very interesting. And in some way, uh, it has put probably all the things we've been uh, defending and explaining about the, the good of or the, the, the benefit of the of the animal traction being used uh, worldwide. And then when you see the bigger picture, it's really you know, it's like a, a, a puzzle no piece that it gets in the position and, and makes sense to everything. So uh, I was very impressed and interested in, in the way that at the end, when you linked all what we were defending about the, the, the links between the environment, between the, the human beings, and as well, all the links about, obviously, about the, the diseases between animals and people and all that. But that that's something I, I, ne I never seen before not never seen, never thought about uh, about that before as a global thing, but the part of uh, the benefits of animal traction really makes uh, a good sense when you put in, in the global picture. My question then is that uh, that concept about uh, uh, one health, in the same way that sustain sustainability has been a word and a concept that has been spread and now has been, you know, it's in the, in the mouth of all the politicians and all the governments and all that, uh, do you think that that one health, you know, is is going to get the same impact? You know, is 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 the next step? No, from from sustainability, we're going to to jump into the concept of of one health, which really uh, makes everything into it. You know, it's 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 nearly holistic. No, would be the other world that sometimes some people use as well, yeah. just to refer to the the picture of the totality, not just only the pieces. No. So do you think really is that that is going to catch that that uh, importance or obviously you're fighting for it explaining that no but what what is your feeling about that because honestly it seems that i never heard that before so no it, that's really interesting i uh, as well there's a lot of answers to that the first one is i really hope it's going to gain sort of widespread recognition and Really nice thing I came across. Um, I don't know how I missed it, but I was looking for a reference or something the other day, and I found a vet record from. Yeah, it looks like it was last. Well, some point last year, about six, six. No, not last year. We're, we're steaming through, aren't we? Nearly a year ago, and there was a letter to the editor calling for uh, anybody who was interested to get involved with something called One Health Lessons, and. One Health Lessons is trying to introduce One Health into the curriculum of school children. Um, they are looking, they're looking for volunteers to give short, short lessons to, to school children about what One Health is and why it is important. And um, it's actually so far some of the lessons that have been apparently have been translated into 70 different languages. So I've actually earmarked that on my on my ever growing to-do list of I'll find out more about that. But I think that is a huge positive that somebody has made this connection that, I mean, because it's the same, um, I think, anyway, with, with sustainability. Like, I remember as a kid, I, you know, we learned about the environment at school and it was me who told my parents to turn the taps off when they were cleaning their teeth, that sort of thing. And, and I see it now, with, you know, I've got two children that are seven and four and they come home and it's quite funny and they tell you all about the environment and to stop using plastic. So I think if we can get it into a school curriculum, fantastic. But I think it's also got to get into general sort of curriculums and it is on the it's on the syllabus of most of the vet schools in the UK now. I don't think it's on the medical curriculum, which is a real concern. And I think there's a blessing and a curse of COVID-19, several, obviously. But in terms of in terms of One Health, I think um, and certainly the One Health conference that has just been um, suddenly there's never been a more important time to recognize the links between animal health, wildlife health and human health. My worry with that though, is it will once again go a little bit backwards to that original thing where it's all about 
disease. So I think it's brilliant that uh, now um, suddenly disease outbreaks and disease preparedness is huge. But I think I think it risks getting lost at much higher levels of government if that's what it sticks to. So I think it's going to be really important to yeah spread the word amongst um, groups such as this to talk about it and go okay so how are we how are, how are we applying it and um, you know very much I think the focus of well I know the focus of FEC2 is, is working equids but um, Barbara and myself Joelle we're lucky in that we work for an organization where it's not just working equids it's also very much looking at those companion equids um, so I think yeah it's a case of go away spread that message and, and keep linking it all together um, I think there's a lot of hope there um, but you see it as well it's quite interesting in in so I'm in my dissertation year now and what I'm doing for my project is I'm actually looking at whether it's possible to deliver joint healthcare for humans and animals so trying to streamline resources and I, I desperately wanted to to look at a working equity community um, but it's it's challenging for a number of different reasons um, mainly in terms of, of access to communities so what I'm doing at the moment is looking at sort of delivering uh, so nothing to do with equids at all but it's looking at delivering healthcare to to people who are homeless who have got companion animals and at first when I suggested this um, I didn't get much buy-in at all and then I got a supervisor who just thought this was a wonderful idea and I've been sort of pointed down the direction of a clinic where they do indeed have um trying to get nurses from a gp practice to go out with vets who go into populations and it turns out when you sort of start searching uh in i think it's california um again they get there's a huge migrant population who come in and do fruit picking and then disappear a little bit um like we see with the sort of brick kiln people sort of appear and then disappear with their animals and where do they all go um and there's a push there to try and deliver this joint health care. And what was really interesting was my supervisor said, it's so nice to see a One Health project that isn't all about disease. So, yeah, uh, and, and I think I think it's going to be brilliant with the equids, uh, with the equid side. So, let's hope. Thanks, Becky. There's, Thank an, there's another question from Mathilde, please. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Becky, for a wonderful talk. I think that was really, really well put, and it's a concept that I'm really, really passionate about too. So I just, um, just was interested in hearing your views. You know, we, um, a lot of the evidence out there um, and the links that have been established are quite um, qualitative, quite descriptive, um, which is needed, of course, because this is such a multifactorial and complex network. But um, of links anyway, but I just wondered what your views are on how we can start measuring this um, as, a, as a whole group, uh, interdisciplinary group, um, you know, as, as a lot of the times actual numbers and quantitative evidence is needed for advocacy for all. And how can we start actually pinning this down to some um, more quantitative evidence um, to bring this to wider attention for wider public? Uh, that's so that is the question Matilda which is very much on my uh, yeah this is part of my project um, there's a couple of things when you look at so historically uh, and again I'm surprised to anyone who knows this but I'd never come across it so it's very there's something called the daily which is the daily adjusted something to like the daily adjusted life expectancy and it's how the World Health Organization measure the impact of certain diseases. And they look at how many life years um, people might lose or that you might expect a population to lose because of a disease. So they've got this metric out there, um, but there are problems with it. Now, policymakers have used that to argue for funding for specific diseases. Now, I'm a vet who had a farm animal background and actually, it was really easy as a farm vet because you it, it was all about sort of productivity um, and it, it, it is all about the money in a way in that the way you would get sort of buy in uh, into things was to, to was to be able to demonstrate your results and a sort of very easy example of that and I apologize for making anyone wince but when I graduated so that was 16 years ago you didn't legally have to give local anaesthetic to a calf when you castrated it. 
Now, I you had to do it once they were over a certain age, but you didn't have to do it outright. And I have this very vivid memory of being the only female in an all-male team. And so there was me, another vet, uh, a male, a male farmer, and three, three or four farmhands. And we were there on mass because we had so many calves to castrate. And quite understandably, I thought the calves were kicking up merry hell about what was happening to them. And there was one calf who was really, really kicking. I remember this farmhand looked up at me and went, I don't know why this daft, apologise for swearing, daft bugger is kicking, do you? And I said, um, yeah. I was like, you've taken a knife to part of its anatomy, which is quite sensitive, and you're pulling it out. Yeah, it's really quite obvious to me. And we, you know, we started trying to suggest that actually, if you let us put local anaesthetic in, they won't feel it. And they were like, oh, no, it'll take too long. It will cost too much money to do the local. And actually what has been shown is that if you give calves local anaesthetic, the procedure is less painful and they have less of a growth check. So what happens is those calves grow a lot faster. So then the farmer goes, ah, actually, OK, yes, it did cost me more to get them castrated. But in the long run, they've made me more money. And I think that's that's where you've all <laughs> it sounds awful. But I think where you've got to sort of tie this together is. I think initially it's got to be qualitative. Get in there and start doing the talking and start finding out. But yeah, I think unfortunately the way policy works is you've got to have evidence. And uh, unfortunately, I think numbers is, is what happens. And so the sort of the, the take I am trying to sort of look at, and I'm fully accepting that it might not be, is that um, and I, this is uh, this is again, I'm sorry, it's another farm example rather than an equid one, but uh, I think again it was in the early 2000s, a researcher in Chad noted that the, the childhood mortality from diseases that could easily be prevented by childhood vaccination was really high amongst the nomadic tribes. The livestock mortality from diseases that could easily be prevented by livestock vaccination was low and it turned out that the livestock were being vaccinated and the children weren't. And so she started looking into why this was, presuming that it was going to be to do with something cultural or it was going to be to do, yeah, a sort of tradition. It was actually because the, the medics, the nurses, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't do the logistics. They couldn't get to these nomadic tribes. They, they couldn't ever get, you know, they had their clinics and no one turned up to them. So then they said, well, hang on a minute. The animal health professionals are getting out there to vaccinate so work together and I just thought this was the most wonderful example and and actually it's far cheaper to vaccinate a child than it is to try to then uh, reactive you know react to that child being very very sick um, but I think all those things it's gonna it takes time so I think it will have to start qualitative and, and asking and and then the numbers may come and they may not come that's the other thing but I think this is where it's really important with the environment is that you might find that actually it is more expensive to do what is better for welfare what is better for human welfare better for animal welfare but you might find that that expense comes at a much greater sort of benefit to the environment and I think that's probably where well certainly where the world is is heading but it's getting that behavior and one of my classmates is doing a really interesting study. He's a, he's a human GP and he is running a study amongst various GP practices where he's looking at has human behaviour changed as a result of the COVID pandemic. So he is looking at, uh, and it is really interesting, and I don't know what experience everyone else has got, but you know, I was sat on a train the other day and somebody said they weren't wearing a mask because, <laughs> because the government doesn't say they have to anymore. And I, I try to keep a straight face because it's just like, wow, that's there's, there's, there's interesting how we have portrayed messages of general science and things there. So, yeah, that's a really rambling answer. Um, and I, I don't really know Matilda's the honest one, but. No, I no, think, I don't think there's a, a lesson. No. Where? <laughs> about this but no thank you those are really great examples thank you back now there's one conclusion there right back if you ask veterinarians to vaccinate the world population <laughs> against covid would be done probably 12 months ago but that's another conversation yeah <laughs> that's there's certainly an argument that's going on in the vet record actually <laughs> but, yeah we are used to vaccinate big herds <laughs> yeah quite fast there's a question from luis from mexico 
WS. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try to speak in English. Sorry for my, my, for my bad English. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, congratulate Rebecca for this interesting presentation. And thank you, Joe, for the invitation. Well, um, for me, uh, this new perspective is important, especially is this inclusion of different, of different roles. It gives us presence, but at the same the time makes us a thing about the responsibility we have to achieve it. For example, um, I am a saddler, and here in Mexico, one of the main problems that affect animal welfare is equipment. Um, harnesses uh, cause many problems in the working animals. And I don't know if uh, there's something in the comments and respect. It's all. Uh, Thank you. No, I'm really, really Thanks, glad Lisa. you've said that because. Um, <laughs> And firstly, Lewis, I am just in awe of anybody who speaks another language. So, <laughs> yeah, I think your English is amazing. Um, so I'm really, really interested in wounds and in harness wounds. I was very lucky as a new graduate. I went to Morocco and, and then I went to Egypt. And as you will be more than aware, probably the commonest thing I saw was huge wounds on the withers. Uh, and yeah, when you saw the, the sort of, ta you know, the, the equipment that was used, you could understand why. But there was a really beautiful moment in Egypt. Uh, and, and this again, to me is a little bit, it's a very simple One Health in action. Uh, but at the time, I didn't, I wouldn't have made that connection. But I remember sort of, uh, oh, I was there in the month of Ramadan and it was boiling hot, it was sort of 40 degrees and it was, it was hard. It was hard work in the, in the days. And I've just got this memory of sort of taking a break from seeing animals and just looking up and noticing what I hadn't noticed the sort of couple of days before, that there was this enormous block of showers and the showers were far too big to be a, for humans and also... I couldn't work out why on earth anyone would want to, to, to shower in the middle of a clinic <laughs> with no sort of door. And then I noticed that people were leading their horses uh, to them. And I said, you know, what, what's happening there? And one of the vets said to me, she said, we know that poor equipment uh, is responsible for most of the wounds we see. She said, but it's taking lots of time to change the equipment. She said, people know that they can come to us with their equipment and they can exchange it for, um, they got some amazing uh, sort of, it was mainly bits of harness. She said, but people won't, you know, people, it's quite hard trying to shift people away from their traditional uh, equipment. She said, but we also know that they were never cleaning their animals. And of course, grit gets on, you know, grit or dirt on the back, rubs under the, under the saddle. And she said, in telling people that they had a free place to come and wash their animal and telling them the importance of washing, uh, she said, we have seen a reduction. So that kind of goes back to what Matilda is saying as well, actually, there were results there. She said, we have seen a reduction in the amount of wounds that we see along the back. So. They weren't seeing a reduction in the ones on, on the withers because they still had the problem with, with the harness and the saddles, but they were seeing a reduction along the back. And she said they do attribute a lot of that to just cleaning them. And then it was really nice, she said, and I'd never really thought about it, but as an aside, she said, what's lovely is quite often the handlers take a shower too, she said, and they don't often have anywhere to wash, she said. And so we do a lot. She said, we do a lot for human health and hygiene. And I just thought... Yeah, I thought that was very beautiful. Um, so I, I, I'm very, very interested in wounds and I'm also fascinated. And, and I'm sorry, Louis, because this is actually, this isn't to do with saddling, but I had an awful situation in Egypt, but it was a real eye opener. Um, and a family came in with a donkey strapped to a cart. Um, and it's it's not a nice story, but the, don the, the donkey uh, had... A heart, well, it had its foot missing on one leg so it was the, the foot had been amputated above the hoof um you could see all the bone and they said the the donkey got its foot stuck under a railway line and oh I, who knows what had happened but it had somehow 
either been cut free or got free and they said we need it to work again tomorrow can you fix its leg and we said no we we cannot fix this leg um and they said we said the animal we have to put it down and they said no 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 you can't do that um we're going to take it to another clinic and they did there was nothing we could do they took it to the clinic down the road who obviously said the same thing and they brought it back to us and that for me was a huge eye opener in that never assume that someone understands why something can't be done like the way they saw it my animal's got an injured leg you can fix it and it was trying to you know sort of get that concept of how can you yeah you can't grow a new foot um sadly and I think the reason why I bring that example in is just to show it with anything that's I think relating to to harness or anything else it's it's time to get a message over isn't it thanks Becky that's those are two thanks. great stories one of them very sad but but it's it's okay. it's the cruise reality right I don't know if we have time for one last question. Uh, it's been already, it's, it's interesting. When you bring people that are passionate about something, so at least one hour and 20 minutes, and here we are all listening and, and sharing information. So uh, there's, a, there's a time for one final question, if someone in the room wants to, to intervene. Well, if not, once again, uh, thank you so much for, for being here. You can say that Matilda is in Australia when she starts going to visit. Yes. I say good morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the meantime, Tamar also joined us from, from Chile. So it's been quite a diverse uh, audience tonight that I think, you know, a global audience for a, a global issue that is One Health. Becky, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. It's it's a we speak so so many times about about one health but we are unfortunately i don't have the time to sit and talk about this with you so it was great to to hear your presentation and uh, as usual this this webinar will be will be available soon in the in the in the youtube channel of the of the facto those who missed the, the previous webinars just go on youtube and if you search for facto you can see all the others uh, once again thank you so much for joining us and Thanks, Becky. Have no, a good thank night. you. It's fantastic yeah, to, to share it with, with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank, thank you. you, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.